in which case, um, let, let me start. Um, uh, welcome everyone, my name is Catherine Barnard and I'm the director of CELS. It gives me huge pleasure to introduce to you today um, my dear friend, uh, wonderful colleague, um, Julian Gosch. Julian Gosch wears a number of hats. I mean, he is a man of many parts. Um, for some of you, he, you will know him as your supervisor. For others, you will know him as a brilliant tax silk. And for others, you will know him um, as a deputy judge. But for many of you, you probably don't know that he's also fenced for Scotland. And that nimble footedness required in fencing will, I hope, allow him to take us through um, the complexities of his subject today. Julian, thank you so much for your time. Um, the way we're going to play it is um, to, uh, you're going to talk for half an hour or so, and then you've kindly agreed to take questions. Um, if anyone has questions, please, could you put them in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box? Julian, the floor is yours and thank you. Uh, well, uh, no, uh, thank you. Uh, it's always a privilege to, to, to um, uh, speak at sales. So the, the thanks are always um, from my direction to, to yours. Uh, let's go. Um, my talk, I'm, I'm echoing, which is annoying. Um, that's better. Um, um, so um, let me uh, pick up my, my, um, my thread, which I had dropped. That's right. Um, my talk is about retained EU law. Uh, number of preliminary points uh, about retained EU law. Um, we're going to come uh, shortly to what, what that is, uh, this body of EU law that, that played, that applied in the UK when the UK was a member state, uh, and that will continue to, to apply um, after 1st January this year. Um, but preliminary point number one, uh, which is very, very, very important. Where you'll find retained EU law, the, the definition of what it is, and if uh, particular provisions are, they count as retained EU law, um, what the consequences are. So what? Well, so quite a lot, and as, as, as we'll see. Um, but my preliminary point is when you look at the, um, the statute, EU Withdrawal Act 2018 that tells you what retained EU law is. The first point is this, the project, the, the objective of having this body of retained EU law is to freeze EU law as at pretty much literally 11 o'clock on the 31st of December 2020. Now the reason that the draft person wants to do that is, in the words of the explanatory notes, um, uh, to have a functioning statute book. Because what's said is, look, the UK has been a member of the EU since 1972. EU law is inextricably linked to pretty much all aspects of UK legal life. Um, having left the, uh, the EU, uh, just to make sure the statutes keep working, keep functioning, we need to preserve EU law as part of our, 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 our domestic law. Um, two things to say about this first point, 1A and 1B, um, call them that. Um, I'm not aware of any other project ever that's tried to do this, to freeze a whole body of law as at a point in time. Uh, 11 o'clock on the 31st of December, 2020. Second, and, and actually more, more fundamentally, the point of this exercise, the reason we've got retained EU law is not, it absolutely isn't, uh, to keep EU law as part of our, and by our I mean the UK's juristic heritage. So what the 2018 Act isn't trying to do is to say, oh, we were members of the EU, EU law has valuable things to teach us, we are going to keep this retained EU law because it's a good thing. It's not that, that's not what it's trying to do at all. It's the opposite. It's saying the UK is, well, it's left the EU. It's just that 
we have to keep EU law for a while because the statutes, all sorts of statutes can't function without it. So retained EU law um, doesn't reflect any sort of, as I say, objective to retain EU law as part of the UK's juristic tradition. Um, rather, it's a legislative technique just to make sure the UK's domestic statutes can work. And we need to hang on to that thought. Second um, uh, preliminary point, um, the, 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 the undergraduates amongst you, I think, wouldn't have got to this, the, the, this aspect of the um, internal market provisions yet. But two of the fundamental uh, uh, free movements, the free movement of persons, the freedom of establishment and the freedom to provide services cross border. Um, they were two of the most important freedoms in EU law when the UK was an, uh, an EU member state. They've gone, they've been excised in retained EU law by statutory instrument. Now, the reason uh, that uh, somebody who tells you that might sound sepulchral is not just because they're important, but because the enabling provision, uh, the, the um, statutory provision that the, the minister used to get rid of establishment and services was section eight of the 2018 Act. And section eight of the 2018 Act, what that says is ministers can promulgate, can, they can enact statutory instruments, but to cure deficiencies, I paraphrase, but it's a perfectly good paraphrase, in retained EU law. So it's where retained EU law, when we get to it, has got some rough edges. That's what section eight on its terms is there to do. So to use that section as an enabling provision to get rid of establishment and services is a big deal. Now, I'm going to get straight to that. The, there are all sorts of rules about EU law and how it works for cases that have reached the courts before 31st December, 2020, I think, We'll, we'll, we'll leave that. That's for another day. Let's get straight to the business end of the talk. Retained EU law, what is it? Before we get to why does it matter? Three categories. First, um, in, and these are all in the EU uh, Withdrawal Act 2018, Section 2, EU derived domestic legislation. Now, what does that mean? It means any UK domestic legislation, primary act or statutory instrument, which was enacted, and I'm speaking broadly here, but it's an incredibly wide definition, either in under section two of the 1972 act, or which, which um, operate to ensure that the UK complies with its EU obligations or relate to EU law. So it's an incredibly wide definition. Any primary act which relates to EU law counts as EU derived domestic legislation. It just does. So what does that mean? Uh, Catherine mentioned I, I'm a tax lawyer and the world's most boring tax is VAT. Now, take the VAT Act. Um, the VAT Act 1994, it's a primary act. It doesn't need saved. We've left the EU, so what? It's still there. That's EU-derived domestic legislation, all right, because it was enacted on any view to ensure the UK's compliance with EU obligations, uh, all to do with the, the VAT, principal VAT directive. But there are other statutes which may have been um, modified changed because, for example, the UK or another member state lost a case in the Court of Justice. Uh, and to the extent that provisions of that act have been modified to secure the UK's um, EU compliance, well, they're EU-derived domestic legislation, all right. But there's a third category, and it's an annoying category. Um, and it's a sort of um, category that gives lawyers a bad name. And it's uh, 
take, for example, the, the Companies Act 2006. Now, the Companies Act 2006 has, when the UK was a, a, an EU member state, it had to comply with, uh, amongst other things, EU shareholder directives. It just did. But it turned out that the 2006 Companies Act and the 1985 Companies Act before it did comply without needing to be changed. Question. Is the Companies Act 2006 EU-derived domestic legislation? It's not been enacted for the purpose of securing EU compliance. It's not been modified. But does it relate to EU law? When a, in a way, it does, because company law has to be EU, or it did when the UK was a member state, it had to be EU compliant. Now, it's, as I say, it's a rather silly, annoying distinction that an act that has never been changed, but nevertheless is EU compliant, for that reason falls outside the notion of EU derived domestic legislation. But it's a real distinction, not a very useful one, um, except to lawyers because it, 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 it goes outside the spirit of what retained EU law is trying to do. Um, we can come back to that during questions. I think I'm just gonna ask you to hold that thought as to what does it mean for a, a, a domestic statutory provision to relate to EU law. Uh, the European Court had an analogous question when it was applying the Charter of Fundamental Freedoms because that's engaged only when the, 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 the circumstances engage EU law. And the Court of Justice adopted a very, very expansive notion as to what that means. Um, the trouble is if you adopt that sort of approach here, pretty much everything in the UK is retained EU law. Second category, this is section three of the 2018 Act, direct EU legislation, regulations and decisions. Um, now all of you, uh, including uh, undergraduates will know that, that regulations and decisions, uh, they are they're, they're legislative acts, all right, of EU institutions, and they are Section 3 retained EU law, all right. But here be careful. Again, although I said VAT is a very boring tax, and it, it is, um, it, it throws up some good examples. There's a very important VAT implementing regulation called unimaginatively the VAT implementing regulation. And that is expressly excluded from being retained EU law, not in the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, but in a different act, the Taxation Cross-Border um, uh, Trade Act 2018, section 42. Now, if you didn't know that was there, you wouldn't know. So there's going to be a real challenge to academics, to counsel appearing in, uh, in, in cases, to judges, in making sure that they're alive to these express exclusions. In category three, other recognized and available EU rights. This is in section four, what are they? They are the EU rights that were located um, by direct application of the treaties or directives. That's what these are. Um, trouble is recognized and available, those terms aren't defined. What does that mean? Uh, again, I'll give you a thought which you can hold and then we can, we can come back to it uh, during questions. I think recognized, given that retained EU law was all to do with trying to freeze EU law as it was at 31st December, 2020, recognized means recognized by a court as part of its ratio and available means enforceable. So it has to have been recognized as part of a ratio of a court that binds another court. So for example, in my world, in the tax world, cases start off in the first year tax tribunal. They don't bind anybody. It's not until the case goes to the upper tribunal that the upper tribunal, because it's a court of record, binds first year tribunals or the English high court. Um, it needs, I think, for a right to be available to have been part of the ratio of a, of a court that can bind another court. And just while I'm here, um, here's a point of irritation. Um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, this was a 
um, you know, a, a, a politically sensitive matter for the current government. They didn't want the Charter of Fundamental Rights to have pretty much any application in UK domestic law post Brexit. Section 5, subsection 5 of the 2018 Act has one of the daftest provisions I've ever come across. It says the Charter of Fundamental Rights doesn't apply post 1st January 2021, I paraphrase, but again, it's a perfectly good paraphrase, but it goes further. And this is something I've never seen before. European Court of Justice cases that refer to and apply the Charter of Fundamental Rights, you read those as if they, they refer to not the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but rather the analogous general principle of EU law. Now, never in my life um, have I seen a section that says read cases that talk about X, but don't pretend they don't mean X, they mean Y. And this is problematic because on no planet is the Charter of Fundamental Rights, of Fundamental Rights a mere codification of gender principles. Of course, they draw on the common shared traditions. We all know that. But if you read the cases on gender principles, when have you got a gender principle, and there's a cross check as to whether that gender principle is indeed a gender principle, and is it consistent with the Charter of Fundamental Rights? The whole point is the Charter of Fundamental Rights is more than a codification of gender principles. You can't just say it's talking about human dignity. Well, let's look at the cases applying the gender principles to do with human dignity. And human dignity is problematic because there are cases that the European Court decided that tell you that different member states are permitted to inform notions of human dignity, cases like Omar Gespielhallen, with their own histories. So it's, 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 it's a silly provision. Now, I mentioned gender principles, gender principles of EU law. Um, I'm going to come back to those, but insofar as these general principles, when the UK was a member state located rights, they would fall under retained EU law because of section four. But, but as you say, hold the thought about general principles because their application has been heavily modified. All right, that's what retained EU law is. Not, not easy. Um, to, to, to find out always what it is, but that's what that, that's what uh, section two, section three, and section four of the 2018 Act says it is. Um, so what? So a particular primary act, or an EU regulation, or a, a right that arises from um, the general, the, the the direct application of the treaty is retained EU law. What about it? Section five tells you what what the consequences are, and put short. Provisions which are retained EU law for UK domestic law enacted pre 31st December 2020, supremacy applies. So if there's any inconsistency between retained EU law and a pre 31st December 2020 UK statute, retain, retained EU law trumps, it wins. Um, post uh, 31st December, so from the 1st of January 2021 onwards, no, uh, supremacy doesn't apply. Now, is that problematic? It's finicky, it's messy, but I don't think it's problematic. We do get into problems, though, when we come back, as I said, we would, to, um, to general principles. Now, general principles, uh, principle of effectiveness, equivalence, prohibition against uh, uh, nationality discrimination, which morphed into the principle of equal treatment, proportionality, all these general principles, after decisions of the Court of Justice, like Mangold, like Ukudavechi, they applied on a freestanding basis. They didn't, so if, um, somebody was relying on their EU rights. It was more than a principle of interpretation. They didn't have to find words either in the treaty 
or um, in, in um, secondary legislation or in UK implementing legislation, the principle just played as a substantive freestanding principle. So the principle of effectiveness, that's what entitles someone to a new remedy if otherwise their EU rights become excessively difficult to enforce. That's changed, that's gone. Because although general principles count as retained EU law because of section four, Schedule 1, paragraph 3 of the 2018 Act, and what it's doing tucked away in a schedule um, is baffling. But in any event, you're told a general principle cannot found a cause of action. What does that mean? What it means, and I think it's binary, if a general principle can't of itself entitle you to remedies, it can't found a cause of action, which would in turn give you a remedy. Um, it's interpretative only. Now this matters quite a lot. Take again, let, let's let's go back to my world. It's it's useful. There is one general principle called abuse of law, um, and it's very much a, 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 a um, uh, it's 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 a um, um, a product of continental juristic thinking. But in EU law, it's an established general principle. It means that if someone, say a taxpayer, does a tax scheme that distorts the way that provisions are supposed to work to give them a tax advantage that nobody, including the DOS person, intended them to have, abuse of law can play as a general principle to simply take that advantage away from them to treat them as if they hadn't done an abusive transaction. Uh, the most recent example of that um, principle being in play is a case that I did that went from the first tier tribunal to the upper tribunal, to the court of justice, back to the upper tribunal, up to the court of appeal, back to the first tier tribunal called Newby. It took 10 years to litigate. Um, a Newby was a case where I was doing it for the taxpayer. The revenue were pleading that because it was a VAT avoidance scheme, that meant that setting up a company should just be ignored. You should tax this trader as if he hadn't set up a company. Why have I gone, gone on about Newey? Well, if it's right, if it's correct, that general principles are interpretative only, where would that have put the revenue? It can't give them a cause of action. The revenue might say, oh, well, we don't need abuse to give us a cause of action. We can, we've got, the power to do that, we can raise tax assessments and we can then interpret those tax assessments by reference to abuse. Well, they might say that, but it's not obvious. Forget the government, come to private applicants. What this means is that any, any prospect of uh, retained EU law giving you new remedies, forget it, forget it. Um, this is qualified by a, um, a, a series of um, finicky rules. So, so far, so bad for general principles, interpretative only. However, and this is Schedule 1, paragraph 39, if you're writing this down. Um, what courts are told, if you're sitting as a judge, is yes, 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 general principles, interpretative only, unless you're bound by a decision. So if I'm sitting as a, an upper tribunal judge and I'm bound by the Court of Appeal, then I have to apply the Court of Appeal decision even if it means applying the general principle in full. So you think, okay, all right, that's a bit messy, but it gets worse because certain courts are entitled to ignore even pre 31st, um, uh, December 2020 decisions. That's the English Court of Appeal, Civil and Criminal Divisions, the Inner House uh, of the Co uh, Court of Session in Scotland, um, the Court Martial, and the Lands Valuation Appeal, um, Appeal Court. They can all choose as of right to depart from pre 31st December 2020 Court of Justice decisions. 
post 31st December 2020 decisions, they have to have regard to them, but no more on any view. So in a sense, those are something they can look at and should look at, but they're not bound by anyway. But the pre 31st December 2020 decisions, the Court of Appeal in England could turn around and say, you know what, we don't like factor time anymore. We're not gonna be, we don't consider ourselves bound to, 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 to apply it. So it's an additional ground on which the Court of Appeal can depart from its own decisions, but it also makes it very difficult because I am told general principle, say it's effectiveness. Interpretative only, oh no, no, I'm bound by the Court of Appeal. Oh, hang on, has the Court of Appeal departed from this? In any context, I might be deciding a tax case, but what about an IP case? So we need to know if the Court of Appeal Supreme Court's entitled to do this too, but they're more used to it. But the Court of Appeal, we need to know, not just if a court of, the Court of Appeal departs from a, a, a CJEU, a Court of Justice decision, we need to know on what terms, what are they doing? Are they abandoning the decision or are they abandoning the principle laid down by that decision? Are they departing from a whole line of cases? We need to know. Now, um, I'll say this in parentheses, I've talked about general principles. It's not always easy to, to know whether a particular concept in EU law is a general principle or not. I'll give you two examples, mutual recognition, the Cassis mutual recognition, and fiscal neutrality, it's VAT again. But mutual recognition, Cassis. Some, I wrote a, an overlong, very boring article um, that Catherine will recollect because she had to read it. Um, uh, which had massive footnotes, um, which I doubt anybody in the right mind's ever read, but where I said mutual recognition was a rather silly concept, nobody needs it. Um, point is, if it's a general principle, it's hoovered up in what I've been talking about, it's interpretative only. If it's not a general principle, but it's part of retained EU law, because you've got pre 31st December 2020 cases that refer to it, it's much harder to know on what basis you, 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 you apply these cases. Fiscal neutrality is the same. It's a principle of VAT that says, um, if two types of supplier make the same kinds of supply, they should be treated the same. It's, a, it's used often as a surrogate for competition law. Last point I want to make. Um, Sympathetic construction. Uh, when the UK was a member state, the English courts, and I do mean English, the, 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 the Scots courts I think were more sensible, but the English courts uh, took on this notion of sympathetic construction that comes from two places, the loyalty clause and supremacy, it comes from two places. Um, and they're told by the Court of Justice look, you've got to try and construe domestic legislation to be EU compliant if you possibly can. Um, fine. The English courts took a fantastically muscular approach and, and, and went far beyond construction. Uh, they started disapplying um, words in a section. The, there was a case called IDT, where uh, 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 purporting to um, implement sympathetic construction, they construed a phrase as saying X bracket, unless it interferes with your EU rights, close bracket. That's not construction. Now, why am I going on about all this before I can work myself up into anti-sympathetic construction rage? Answer, the explanatory notes of the 2018 Act think that sympathetic construction applies to retained EU law. I think that's just wrong. Ask yourself this, sympathetic to what? If you're construing retained EU law, EU derived domestic legislation, direct EU legislation, other recognized uh, and available EU rights, the constitutional architecture post-Brexit is the um, withdrawal agreement brought into um, uh, UK law by a different part of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, retained EU law in the 2018 Act that we've just been talking about, the Internal Market Act, 
um, the devolution settlement, so the Scotland Act, the Wales Act, and the, and, and the Northern Ireland Act, each of which has its own very clear legislative agenda, which will conflict with each other. So again, there is no way that you could look at these different statutes as being some sort of coherent um, parts of a, a, a constitutional assemblage. They're not. But the one thing we do know is that the UK is left. So when you're construing retained EU law, do you look at EU law and say, look, its parentage, this retained EU law's parentage comes from EU law itself, particularly direct EU legislation, but actually all of it. Um, we should just carry on construing it in the same way as we always did. Absolutely not. Uh, I think the analogy is, and there's no, um, uh, there's no political baggage here, of ex-British colonies, which had uh, colonial legislation, which was still there post-independence. And the question then became, how do we construe this? And you'll find um, some very good jurisprudence telling you, you construe it differently because the world has changed and it's constitutionally improper to not recognize that the world has changed. Um, I gather from um, Laurent Bartels, Australians are taught this in the first week of first year. Um, uh, I, 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 um, I didn't know it until I looked into it to, 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 to write about it. Um, but as I say, there's some very good jurisprudence. And um, this doctrine uh, is called um, a local jurisdiction exception. It said, look, put short, the world's changed. There's a, there's a good example. There's a Jamaican case called Carreras. For a tax lawyer, it's one more boring case all to do with that, uh, tax avoidance. But what's interesting about it from the perspective of what we're talking about is Lord Hoffman says, this Jamaican legislation is identical to UK legislation, but you don't construe it the same. Of course you don't, this is Jamaican. Um, it's very, very simple and straightforward, he says. So again, the explanatory notes absolutely think sympathetic construction applies, but that's the government saying this. And I think that's myself, I think that's just wrong. So I'll stop there. Um, and uh, I, I hope that that's been of some use uh, and of some interest and, and um, I'm, I'm up for questions. Thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. And I've been looking myself at the 2018 Act and struggling with it personally, and you have shed considerable amounts of light um, and thus overcoming the heat with which I was um, experiencing this um, pretty ghastly piece of um, uh, legislation. So thank you very much indeed. Now, can I encourage the audience to ask questions in the Q&A?